Well, blessings, everyone, and welcome to Answers. I'm Dale, and I thank you so much for joining with me today. Uh, at the time of our gathering together, it's just a beautiful day outside, and it's rather cool with a blustery north wind. Uh, just a, a very invigorating day, a beautiful day, uh, that the Most High God has allowed at least this portion of His creation to experience. And so it's good that you gather together. We're going to be looking at some things, I think, that really, really speak to each one of us today. Because have you ever wondered about why things happen? You ever just wonder why things happen? You wonder why things happen in your life, why this occurs, why that occurs. Uh, sometimes that can be in the negative. Sometimes that can be in the positive. I mean, uh, a lot of times I just look at things uh, and just go, Lord, uh, just thank you and I praise you and I bless you for the blessings that you have given, for the things that you have granted for the things that you have allowed us to experience and what you are showing in each one of our lives. And it's good to give thanks for that. There's other times when there's things that happen and you go, God, why is this occurring? What is going on with this? Particularly if it's a negative thing. Particularly if it's a difficult thing. Something we don't understand. And uh, quite often we have to remind ourselves what the scripture says. These things in the life of the believer pass through the hand of a loving God. Okay, they pass through the hand of a loving God. And so he knows what's going on. He's no, he knows what's happening. And so what I try to do uh, all the time in these situations, I think I'm getting quicker about it. It's not taking me three or four days to get there maybe, but maybe three or four minutes, something like that. It's when something negative happens or something just grates me the wrong way or something happens like that, that I'm going, okay, Lord, what is it that you have prepared for me down the road that this particular moment right here, this particular episode, that this is part of the preparation for what is yet to come. What is it that you're doing here? What is happening? And when you look at it that way, even if it's a fiery dart of the enemy, even if it's an attack of the enemy, you know that it's for the upbuilding and the betterment of who we are as, as individuals. You know, Paul told Timothy that. He said, you know, everyone who desires to be Christ-like will undergo trials, tribulations, persecutions. <clears throat> we know from our studies and end time things, Remember, we spent a long time looking at various portions of that, the Olivet Discourse. <coughs> Excuse me. Still got a bit of that cough. Uh, First and Second Thessalonians. We know that in the last days that darkness will increase, that trials and tribulations and persecutions will increase. We know that the man of lawlessness will attack and will persecute two particular groups. One is Israel, the Jewish people, and the other are believers the church, the true church, and those who profess to be Christians. Those are the two that Antichrist will attack. No, no, no. I know what a lot of people say. A lot of people say, well, that can't be right because we're going to be out of here before the Antichrist comes along. We're going to be raptured away prior to that time. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not what the scripture teaches. And people will say, well, that's what brother so-and-so on TV, on this fine station right here, says. This is what uh, my pastor said. This is what this teacher said. I totally understand. I know. I know. And I have a lot of good friends that believe that. But it's not what the Word of God says. Okay? I used to believe a lot of things because I didn't know what the Word of God said. I believed what somebody else told me. And I believed what I wanted to believe. And I believe, this is the worst one, I believed what I thought I knew. Have you ever believed what you thought you knew? And then you find out that it's only uh, incorrect. But we allow the Word of God to, sh to sharpen us, to show us the truth. And so uh, the Scripture is real clear about that, that the, uh, the true believers, the body of Christ, by definition, will undergo the, the attack and the tribulation. It's described as the great tribulation of the man of lawlessness. Let me just say this, then we'll move on. Make sure you clarify this. The great tribulation is the man of lawlessness, the antichrist, the evil one, pouring out his wrath upon Israel and the church. Okay, The day of the Lord, you see that phrase all through Scripture, said in different wording, in that day, in that great day, in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is God pouring forth his wrath upon unbelieving mankind. People usually get confused. and I mean, good, great, godly people. Okay? I'm not questioning salvation. I'm not questioning motivation. I'm not questioning any of that kind of stuff. No, 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 no. But they get confused. They think the great tribulation is God pouring out his wrath. And it's not. That's the wrath of God. The great tribulation is Satan empowering Antichrist. And so we're not to be surprised by any of this stuff. Where we are today, we've been going through the book of 1 Peter for a number of weeks now. And the very first verse that we're going to begin with today is where we sort of left off last week. is in the fourth chapter. And it tells us about these type of things. How we're to act and how we're to react. 
So it's in uh, 1 Peter, 4th chapter, verse 12 says this. Beloved. Now notice how Peter calls him that. He says, beloved or beloved. John's real big on that. In John's writing, everybody is beloved. Everybody is the loved one, okay? Peter uses that term right now. And so he's speaking to him and he says, you are believers. He said, I love you. You are beloved of God. And if you remember where we started at the very beginning, these are believers that came out of Judaism. They've been scattered because of things that have happened in their lives. Literally been run out of town. And he said this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. We are not to be surprised by the fiery ordeal among us. Well, what fiery ordeal is, is he referencing here? Well, we don't know particularly. But we know that they had been scattered, like I said before, that they had been undergoing some things, that had been persecuted. There's any number of fiery ordeals that are going on right now with any of our lives. Okay? Any number of things. There's fiery ordeals happening with believers right now where they're literally dying because they profess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They literally say this, are you a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus? You say yes, they cut your head off. That's a fiery ordeal. Sometimes the fiery ordeal may be just what's happening within the local body of Christ, that there's tension, that there's stress, that there's things that are happening right there. We're not to be surprised by that. People say, well, I thought we were supposed to live in love with one another. We are as believers. And believers, I think, do that. Believers really seek to do that. But quite often what you find within the organizational church is that you're dealing with what Jesus referred to in a parable as the wheat and the tares. You have the wheat, those that are truly saved, and then you have the tares, those that are not saved. Tares and wheat look similar when they sprout up, when they're growing, and you don't know which one is which until the fruit comes forth. Wheat brings forth fruit. Tare does not bring forth fruit. And so what you see within the body of Christ, that there will be people that look like believers and they act like believers, except you will find that they will be a source of fiery ordeals because they're not really true believers. I think one of the greatest missionary grounds uh, for the organism, the body of Christ today, is the organizational church. Those that come to church and those that are a part of it who are not really saved. So whether it's that type of thing or whether it's just an overt attack, uh, there's things that are happening within our society where we live that are literally overt attacks uh, against the faith, against the belief. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. The scripture tells us that. It tells us this. Fear not. It's going to get worse. So Peter's saying right here, don't be surprised at this fiery ordeal among you. And then he says this next little phrase, <coughs> which comes upon you for your testing. For your testing. See, these fiery ordeals quite often test us. Well, exactly what's being tested by the fiery ordeal? Ever thought about that? What is being tested? What's being tested is the faith. What's being tested is belief. This is what's going to happen particularly in the last days and in the end times. When the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, exalts himself and starts doing all this kind of stuff, you're going to start seeing people just bug out of the organizational church. Because they're going to start saying, yeah, yeah, well, that was nice. But, you know, now the government tells us to do this. And, you know, you've got to be submissive to the government. The Bible says that. Everybody always misteaches and misinterprets Romans 13 particularly. And uh, so you'll see them just sort of falling by the wayside. When there's a fiery ordeal and a test, it reveals the true nature of your faith and your belief. Is it just a comfortable belief that's part of a societal type of thing? Or is it a true belief that will stand firm? And so he's saying, don't be surprised by these fiery ordeals that will come among you. They're, they have come for your testing. And you say, well, who, who's initiating the testing? God allows that testing. Sometimes God may initiate the testing. Other times he may allow the testing. And a lot of times people say, well, that's not very fair. <laughs> it has nothing to do with fair, okay? There's several examples of it in Scripture. Probably the best example is Job. Okay, Job, uh, if you haven't read Job lately, just go read the first um, two or three chapters of Job and see what's going on. Pay real close attention. Because what you see is that God initiated the whole thing that happened between Satan and Job. Satan had been trying to get at Job, and he couldn't get to him because God had planted around him a hedge of protection. Satan actually lets that slip during the conversation. And then God looks at Satan, though, and he says this. At the very beginning, he says, Have you considered my servant Job. Have you considered him? In other words, and God already knew this, that Satan had been trying to get to him and trying to trip him up and trying to do this. 
And so God actually initiated and allowed Satan to do some things, precipitated that action. And you say, well, that was harmful to Job. Oh, well, yeah, it was. Yeah, it cost him everything he owned, cost him his ten kids for a while. For a while. And you say, well, what's that all about? Well, Job was left with his ten children that died, with all of his property gone, sitting in sackcloth and ashes with sores and boils all over his body, with a nagging wife who's sitting there saying, why don't you just curse God and die? Well, isn't that lovely? That's what he was left with. But Job said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. When it's all said and done, and Job's three buddies come in and spend a week just sitting there staring at him and saying nothing to him. And then when they finally say something to him, and said, well, obviously this has all come upon you because of sin in your life, which was not true. At the end of it, wonderful declarations of who God is and how God created. Job speaks these things. And then Job has everything restored to him double. Let's say, I don't remember the exact numbers. Let's say he lost 7,000 cattle. He had 14,000 cattle restored to him. Let's say that he lost 1,000 sheep. He had 2,000 sheep restored to him. He'd lost 10 children. I'll ask Michael this. He's on the, he lost 10 children. How many children did he have restored to him? How many do you think, Michael? I don't remember. Oh, I, he doesn't remember and he's scared to say. But he smells a trap. He's a wise guy. Okay, he really is. Because you would think that he would have, he lost 10 children, so he, you, you would think he would have 20 children given to him. No, he only had 10 children. He had 10 more children. Well, why not 20? Because the other 10 are already in glory. See, he, these 10 died, but they're in glory awaiting him. He would see them soon. He had 10 more. He didn't have another wife. He had the same wife. I, I sort of tongue-in-cheek sort of chuckle saying that was sort of her punishment for the way she acted. She had 10 more kids. Uh, uh, I don't think that's really true, but it, there might be a little truth to that. You know, I don't know. But you see that Job did nothing to receive all this, and yet God allowed it. God precipitated. Why does he do all that? Why should we not be surprised? Why doesn't God just stop the fiery ordeal? Why does he test us sometime? I'm going to give you the answer to this, and then we're going to take a break and come back and read some more verses. It's to his praise and his honor and his glory. Everything is to the glory of God. I definitely do not understand the why or the how or the timing and all this. But if I keep my focus upon him and, Lord, and say this, Lord, it is to your praise and to your glory, then God is glorified in it. And he will do what he desires to do. I tell you what, I better take a break here real quick. We'll come back and look at some verses, so stay with me. Stud, hon. Eat up. There's plenty more. Billy, eat your stud. Think of the termites whose homes were protected with termidor. Aw, oh, Dad. The brands will never get termidor. They're clueless. Yeah, they even think homeowners insurance covers our damage. <laughs> Do you hear laughing? It's probably just the pipes. Target pest control. We aim to please. back to answers we're looking and examining the scripture out of first peter 4, uh, 4 fourth chapter beginning in verse 12 
where Peter's saying, don't be surprised by the fiery ordeal. Now, the 12th verse and the 13th verse are one sentence. So let me read the 12th verse again. Then watch what he says as to how we are to respond. So verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. He's showing us right here, don't be surprised by this, but then he uses the word but, okay, giving us a little different other side to this, saying that to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, there's going to be degrees as to how each one of us individually share the sufferings of Christ. There will be some believers that will share the sufferings of Christ to the point of death, dying for the faith in the same way he did. There will be others who will share the sufferings of Christ in relationship to being rejected by family, for instance, or rejected by a church, or rejected by a community. Whatever it may be, that we share in the sufferings of Christ. We're not to be surprised by this. Jesus told us that. He said the slave's not any greater than the master. So if the master went through something like that, the slaves will go through it also. That's the picture that he painted. But how are we to act in the midst of the sufferings, and to whatever degree it may be? He says we're to rejoice. He said keep on rejoicing. You're living a pattern and a style of rejoicing in your life. And so if you are, things are going great and wonderful, you're rejoicing. If things are not going great and wonderful, you're rejoicing. You keep on rejoicing. Uh, James says it this way in, in, in his letter. He says, count it all joy, my brethren, when you face various trials. Count it all joy. You have a decision how to act. It doesn't mean I have to like it. It doesn't mean I have to enjoy it. We're not saying that type of foolishness. No, no. We're saying to determine you're going to count it joy. It's not going to rob me of my joy. I'm going to keep my joy in the Most High God. That's what he's saying. And he says, keep on rejoicing. To what purpose? so that also at the revelation of his glory. That's speaking about the end time. That's speaking about when the Lord comes again. That's the reason I started the way we did today, to where we can tie this stuff together. Just about every portion of the scripture says something about the time when the Lord's going to be coming and ruling and reigning, or the time that we will be with him forever and ever. So he's saying that we need to keep on rejoicing so that when he comes, when he reveals his glory, that we will rejoice with exaltation. We will be exalting Him. We will be exalting in Him. Right now, as we're doing that, we're literally, for lack of a better term, in the training ground. We're literally experiencing this in the natural. But then when He comes and He translates us and we take on our new bodies and all the wondrous things that will happen, joy immeasurable, joy unspeakable, joy beyond anything we can imagine right now. But at this point in time, we're to rejoice. Then he says this, verse 14, he gives us an example of how this uh, may come about and what he's talking about. He says, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. In other words, if someone makes fun of you, if they blaspheme you, if they revile you, if they just speak evil things, if they do evil things against you, for the name of Christ, for the name of Christ, you are blessed. And that name of Christ is really interesting. Uh, in our, in our local Bible studies right now, we're, we're studying the book of uh, Acts. And you see that the, the, the disciples healed in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. And everybody goes, oh, yeah, I know what that means. I, I know what that means. But when you start thinking about it, what does it really mean? Well, in that context, it's talking about in the authority of the Lord, by the power and authority at the end of Matthew. Jesus said, I grant unto you all power and all authority to go as witnesses. And he says, the things that I do, you'll be doing even greater things. So what he's saying right here, somebody reviles you for the name of Christ. What he's talking about, he's talking about for the personhood, for the character, for the authority and the power and all that is the Lord Jesus Christ, Messiah, the uh, Hebrew name Yeshua HaMashiach, right? And someone reviles you for that because of your faith and belief in that, you're blessed. Because, and then he tells us why, because the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. There's several places in scripture, this is one of them right here, Acts has got a couple, where you see the triune nature of God all together in one verse. You revile for the name of Christ, the Son. You are blessed because of the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you, the Father. He said, it's the spirit of God that rests upon you. You're blessed even though they revile. And then he, then he says this, he, he warns them, verse 15. 
make sure, make sure that none of you, so the idea is make certain, we have a role, we have a responsibility. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. I just love that. <laughs> so often, uh, Peter does this, Paul does it in his writings. They'll be going through a list of sins <coughs> or of evil or something. And then they throw in this thing and you go, well, that's not that bad. Well, apparently in the eyes of the Lord, it is. Okay? You, in the end of uh, the first chapter in Romans, Paul's listing all these evil sins. And then right in the middle of uh, maybe eight or nine or ten of these things that he's listing, he says, disobedient to parents. And that's in the midst of fornicators and murderers and thieves, like, disobedient to parents. Here he goes along and he's saying this, don't come along and murder somebody. Don't come along and be a thief. Don't be an evildoer. And don't be a troublesome meddler. Get in trouble for it. And then come back and say that you're suffering and you're undergoing trials and tribulations. That's what he's saying. He said, no, you're not suffering. Yeah, you're suffering because you're paying the punishment for what you've done, perhaps. The fruit of the life that's done that right there. And your meddling has caused all this trouble. Well, don't come back and say, oh, that you're righteously suffering. You're not. You're suffering because of doing evil. But look at that again. He said, make sure that none of you suffer. He's saying, don't make these decisions. Obviously, don't kill, don't murder, don't be a thief. Don't be any kind of evildoer or a troublesome meddler. Don't meddle in other people's business. Don't seek to cause trouble. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't do what the Scripture tells us to do. The scripture tells us to uh, be in relationship to one another, to love one another, to care for one another, to bear one another's burdens, to, to listen to one another, to encourage, to you know, exhort one another. We're to do all these things. But you know the difference with a troublesome meddler. Okay? Paul actually warns Timothy about that. He says, you know, tell these women to quit being busybodies. People who don't work are busybodies. And they become busybodies and they start yakking, yakking, yakking. And they always do it in the name of the Lord or for the children or for the good of the body. But they're troublesome meddlers. And he said, don't do that. But then he says this, but, another but, if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed but it's to glorify God in this name. So he's saying, if you're suffering in the name of Christ, don't be ashamed for it. Don't be ashamed in any way. Paul wrote about that. He says, uh, writing to Timothy, he said, uh, uh, Onesiphorus was not ashamed of me, even though I was in bonds. He was in jail. He was in prison. Some people were ashamed of him because of that. We're not to be ashamed if we are suffering because we're a Christian. That right there breaks down a lot of walls and barriers. Because you say, well, in our culture, in our society, you don't really suffer that way. Oh, yes, you do. Within political realms, within certain societal realms, even within certain churches, if you come across and you're a little too zealous for the Lord, the general idea is, oh, they'll get over it soon enough. You know? No, if you're suffering for Christ, don't be ashamed of it. Let me read these last three verses and we'll be done. Our time's flying by. He says this, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. You know that verse. Did you know the context? And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? What he's saying this is this. <coughs> those who are believers will be tested by God. There will be fiery ordeals and trials and tribulations that he will allow to come our way to uh, strengthen our faith and define our faith, confirm our faith, affirm our faith. Okay? This will happen. And he says this type of judgment will come from God. He says if that happens with us and begins with us and we're saved, What's going to be the outcome of those who don't have the gospel of God? In the last couple of verses, he actually deals with that thing. He quotes an Old Testament passage right here in verse 17. He says, And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? In other words, the idea being that the righteous are the ones who've called upon the name of the Lord. They've repented, they've confessed, they've been baptized for the cleansing away of their sins. But even when that's happening and we're truly saved, life will be hard sometimes. There will be trials. There will be tribulations. There will be difficulties. If it's that way for those who are truly saved, what about those that are godless and that are sinners? What's going to happen with them? What's going to occur with them? Well, what's going to happen is if they don't repent and if they don't confess, they will find themselves before the Most High God in judgment, the great white throne judgment. They will be judged, and they'll be judged upon their works. Okay, they're just upon their works. And if there be a man whose works are found to be totally righteous and totally without sin, then he will be brought into the presence of the Most High God in the glory. The thing is, 
there has never been a righteous man save for the Lord Jesus Christ. No, not one, as the scripture says. So there will not be found one. So everyone at the great white throne judgment will be found guilty. It says the Lord will open the book and the books will look at the deeds and then they will be cast in the lake of fire. We as believers will also be judged. We'll be judged at the Bema seat, the mercy seat judgment. And we'll be judged before the Lord Jesus Christ. And our response will be basically this. We're covered by the blood of the Lamb of God. Okay, we're covered by the blood of the Lamb of God. That judgment is more for the sake of uh, rewards and awards that the Lord's going to be granting. Then the last verse says this. Therefore, so the word therefore means what? In conclusion to everything that we've been bringing forth right here. Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. That right there is sort of a synopsis of what we've been talking about. Those who suffer according to the will of God. You mean it's, sometimes it's the will of God for people to suffer? It was the will of God for the Lord Jesus Christ to suffer. You see with the disciples, the apostles, the twelve, there was the suffering with each one of them. All of them died horrific deaths except for one, John. And he was in prison and had all sorts of things happen to him. He says, therefore, when you suffer according to the will of God, here's what we do. We entrust our soul to the faithful creator in doing what is right. We continue to do what is right. If doing what is right causes us to suffer because of our faith and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we just entrust our soul to the Creator. People say, well, what if they kill us? Really? If you're a true believer, that's not even a consideration. If somebody decides they want to kill you because of your faith and belief, that's just God's way of bringing you home. Yeah, just His way of bringing you home. We need to realize that it is the Lord who keeps us. He's called us to entrust our soul, our very being, our spirit unto Him. We will have suffering. That suffering is the will of God. It's okay. It's all right. Let's determine in our hearts to do what is right. Okay? Don't be surprised by the fiery ordeal that comes your way. Let me pray for us real quick. Uh, Father, I just thank you for a, a word that is at, at once encouraging but also challenging in understanding. Because, Lord, we do entrust ourselves to you. We do trust you. Uh, Lord, sometimes we do question. We want to know why this has come this way, why this has happened. But Lord, let us rest and let us entrust our soul unto you and let us continue to do what is right so that in everything you and you alone will be glorified. Father, I thank you for this time together and we just bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for being with me and I will see you again next time. Remember, if you're missing these episodes, you can find them online. Just go to my website, okay? I'll see you later. Bye-bye.